factored by the traffic commission unless listed on the agenda but may be referred to the city engineer for administrative follow-up uh, currently we don't have any individuals requesting to speak um, and uh, no written statements have been submitted also please silence all cell phones during the meeting and please remember to mute your microphones when you are not speaking Well, that makes it easy. Um, we'll just jump then to uh, number five, our summary notes from our February 15th, 2023 meeting. Um, turning to my fellow commissioners, any comments uh, or anything on the summary, mo summary notes for item five? Around the table we go, hearing none, um, we will no vote required. We'll go ahead and move on to item six. We get through this in record time. Now, um, item 6A, our engineer report. Uh, may we please request, although he's already up there, uh, engineering associate uh, Bradley Eckhart to present the first report. Thank you and good evening. My name is Bradley Eckhart. Tonight I'm going to discuss the proposed stop sign installations at 12 locations in the city. I'm going to start by identifying the locations and area of, areas of concern. I'll show an example of these issues at one of the intersections, and I'll follow up by explaining the public outreach and provide a staff recommendation. All right, so let's get into it. This is a vicinity map for the first location of Campbell and Fordham, which is southeast of Lynn, and Jans, uh, Lynn at Jans Road. Here's a location map to help you get your bearings. Currently, this intersection is uncontrolled, meaning there are not any stop signs or yield signs for any directions of traffic. The proposal is to stop control Fordham in both directions at Campbell. Here is the vicinity map for the second location, which has the remaining 11 proposed stop signs. The Deer Ridge community is located southeast of Lynn Road at Wendy Drive. Here's the location map that shows where the proposed stop signs will go. Currently, all the intersections in the Deer Ridge community are uncontrolled, so no stop signs or yield signs. We are proposing to stop control the terminating leg at each T intersection. And just to clarify, we are not proposing a bunch of multi-way stop signs throughout the community, but rather stop control each terminating leg. Many of you are probably wondering why this is being proposed. The traffic division has some areas of concern at these intersections. Failure to, lead, to yield the right of way is the most important one. If two people approach an uncontrolled intersection at the same time, many drivers are not sure who has the right of way. There is also impaired visibility at all these intersections, including corner landscaping, curbside parking, road curvature, and corner walls. I have researched the collision history for the last three years at all 12 intersections. There was a broadside collision at Homestake Place at Aaronlea Avenue involving a northbound left versus an eastbound through. The primary collision factor was an auto right of way violation which could have been potentially, could have been avoided if a stop sign were present. There have not been any collisions at the other, at the other 11 intersections during that time. All right, so I wanna show you one of the intersections and the driver behavior that we're trying to eliminate. This is a street view photo of southbound Golden Crest at Aaron Leia Avenue, showing current conditions with no stop sign. Here's the southeast corner of Golden Crest at Aaron Leia. There's corner vegetation and a vertical curve. Here's the southwest corner of Golden Crest at Aaron Leia. Notice how close this intersection is to the intersection of Aaron Leia and Wendy Avenue. This is right where the right of way confusion comes into play. Drivers heading southbound on Golden Crest are not yielding to traffic on Aaron Leia Avenue. And this is the, the driver behavior that we're looking to eliminate. Public outreach was performed in advance of this meeting. A total of 161 meeting notifications were mailed out on April 20th. The reason we did ex such extensive outreach is that a lot of residents are concerned with the aesthetics of new signs in the neighborhood and may oppose the installation. Every stop sign insta installation comes accompanied with a 24 by 24 inch stop sign, a white limit line, and a white stop legend. Those three elements are the source of the aesthetic concerns for residents. The traffic division prioritize, prioritizes safety over convenience citywide there, the, there are three ways that the public could provide input at this meeting, by attending it in person, 
participating virtually through Zoom, and to submit an email to Sioux staff. As of this moment, we received feedback from five res or four residents in the Deer Ridge community, and they all opposed, and I had one from the Campbell and Fordham, and they supported the proposal. I want to provide a quick summary of the benefits of these stop signs. They will clarify who has the right of way, which will also have a benefit to cyclists and pedestrians. They will help mitigate this impaired sight distance. We will achieve consistency with best uh, practices policies. And then one thing that I want to point out is that they are not designed to control speeding in any way. So let's conclude with the staff recommendation. The staff recommendation is in the staff report, and that includes, concludes the presentation. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> uh, does the commission have any questions for staff? Sir. Uh, Mr. Eckert, um, thank you for your, your report. Appreciate it. Um, on page two of, of your report, uh, to lead off the section on background, it says, the staff received public requests for the city to consider the installation of stop sign control at 11 T intersections. Um, can, can you explain or at least elaborate on the number of public requests that were received for the installation of the 11 uh, stop signs? Sure. So I originally got a request. I got one request for a Golden Crest at Aaron Lea. I went out there, I did a field check. I observed the same behavior that they were talking about. So I had put that on the list. And then as I drove through the rest of the neighborhood, I noticed that none of the other uh, intersections had stop signs. So we weren't, in, we weren't just gonna do one and not look at the whole community. The other thing that I wanna mention is, if this were a brand new development that we're starting tomorrow and they're going through conditions, this would be conditioned for stop signs at all these locations. Okay, so, but the originating request came for the, the intersection at Golden Crest and Aaron Lay? That is correct. Okay. Any, any other requests? And also Campbell and Fordham. Okay, sure, but I, I'm just looking We're at, talking Deer Ridge, okay. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just looking at Deer Ridge here. Um, were there any other public requests for any of the other 10 stop signs in this community? There were not. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Just, just a question about process. How does one make the request for a stop sign? And then part two, uh, from the city's perspective, how does this compare to other neighborhoods? Like this, this neighborhood, when, when you're taking me through, it reminds me a little bit of my neighborhood. And I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, I know that there are limitations with staff to get out to every neighborhood and look at uh, everything, you know, uh, ahead of time, but how, how does this compare to other places across the city? And is that, uh, you know, something that we're looking at as well? So we're not extremely proactive about them. I'm more looking for customers to call, send an email, initiate the request. And then I go investigate after that compare in comparison to other neighborhoods. There aren't a lot of neighborhoods in the city that are uncontrolled intersections. That's, that's rare. So usually when I get a request for a stop sign, it's a two-way, and they're requesting multi-way so to add already to the existing. It's very rare that I have one where they request one and there's nothing. It's an uncontrolled intersection. So there's not a lot of, there aren't a lot of neighborhoods that don't have stop signs to answer your question. That's rare. Okay, and um, I do want to add uh, additional comments on that. Um, uh, this item that's before you that where we're uh, recommending an installation of stop signs at these T intersections or these uncontrolled intersections, uh, this is a practice that we've been bringing to the Traffic Commission uh, probably since the commission uh, started in, uh, you know, the late, late 90s. And so usually we've been bringing, you know, one report every year. So this is the report for this calendar year. We'll probably bring another one next year. So it's, Slowly but surely, as uh, uh, through time, people have been reporting these to us. We've been doing the investigations and then bringing it to the commission. And, and so most of the intersections in town are now have the stop signs in place. They're still gonna, you're gonna drive through parts of the city. You'll see the older neighborhoods that don't have the stop signs. This happens to be one of them. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Yes. Uh, first, thank you so much for your wonderful report. I just have a one more of a point of a clarification. After you received the initial request uh, from the um, intersection that started the whole um, investigation into the other similar intersections uh, and the three-year report of the collision history, did you find that the other intersections had similar collision history as the initial uh, indicated um, intersection that you were first looking into? No, let me clarify. There actually wasn't, an, there was no collision at Golden Crest at Aaron Lea. There was only a collision at, is that it? Yeah, Homestake at Aaron Lea, which is one, one street to the east. But all the other ones did not have any tra collision, any collisions over that three year period. Got it, thank you. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Just a, a few questions. Um, I think it was in your presentation, in, if I recall, it's Golden Crest at Aaron, Le Aaron Lea, right next to Lynn Road, fairly close to Lynn Road. Um, is there any concern adding that stop sign as you turn off to Lynn, you're gonna have a backup or at any point, you know, possibly blocking or causing issues with Lynn Road? That was what I was, we're only gonna be stopping the terminating leg, so it won't be a multi-way stop. So if you're coming off, it's actually off of Wendy. If you make a, if you're headed southbound on Wendy and you turn eastbound on Aaron Lea, there's no stop control there. It's only for the people heading southbound on Golden Crest. Okay. Um, is that the right intersection I was thinking of if we go back to your presentation? Yeah. So this is Golden Crest at Aaron Lea, and then that's Wendy Drive that you see as the next intersection. Okay. Um, and then I believe uh, Mr. Mashiko kind of hinted at this is is this a situation where this neighborhood just happened to be it's one of the older neighborhoods in the city that's why when it was planned out or um it just does not have any controlled intersections within it it just happened to be it's just an older neighborhood that's exactly right got it um in terms of the public outreach um Remind me what the requirements are or the guidelines that we use to do our public outreach. Is it within 500 feet of an intersection or how do we tackle this particular issue? I mean, the numbers look good. I think you said 170 homes were contacted or, or residents, but I just want to get a better idea. So usually we go 500 feet from the crosswalk or the intersection, things like that. There's only two entry points to this community. You can enter off of Wendy, off of Aaron Lea, or Deer Valley off of Lynn. So I went to everybody, every home in that whole entire neighborhood. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, anyone that it's going to impact. Okay. Um, I think that is all the questions I have. I'll turn over any of, yes, Commissioner Hype. Just a comment about the, the presentation. I know you show us the map, and you know if you look at like one of the, the Google Maps or whatever it is, I don't know how the other commissioners feel, but it would help to see the, the satellite photo of it, just to see how close and where the houses are in proximity to, rather than just the lines in the streets. Do you know what I I do. Thank you. I will do that next time. Any other commissioner comments? Commissioner Immel. Uh, yeah, just a, just a few follow-up questions. So um, on page four of the report, it says a total of 161 notices were mailed. And Mr. Eckert, I think you said uh, notices were mailed to every every home in the community? That's correct. So it's total of 161? No, because Campbell and Fordham, we did the 500 feet from that intersection. Okay. okay. So it was two lists totaling the 161. Okay, I got it. So I think it was around 30 for Campbell and Fordham, so around 130. Okay. Um, and so after sending out the notices, I mean, I, I'm looking at uh, a package of emails that were waiting for me when I got here, and there's a total of uh, four people who emailed staff in response to the notices. That is correct. And n nothing else? No, no phone calls? No? No. Okay. I had four for the Deer, Deer Ridge community, those that you see in front of you, and then I got one for Campbell and Fordham. 
Which and that's, they're in separate piles. Right. So that email is a standalone email? Yes. Okay. All right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further questions before we move on to our public speakers? Okay. Hearing none. Um, and do we have speakers for this engineer's report? Five individuals have requested to speak on this item. Speakers are allowed three minutes. And for the record, zero written statements have been submitted. Chair, I'm going to hand you one more speaker card, OK? Wonderful. And before we move to our first speaker, just for clarification, all the written emails, all that gets put into the record as, as far as just making sure it's kept together, right? Yeah. Yes, that's that is correct. Okay. Um, okay. Our first speaker is, and you help everybody help me with the last names. Um, Commissioner McMahon knows. Um, Diane Brand. Brandy. I was going to get there. Ma'am, you have three minutes. housing area they are T intersections so as I come down Golden Crest down my street it dead ends at Aaron Lee now obviously and according the reason these stop signs are not needed is because and I, I'm hoping perhaps the sergeant that's present can correct me if I'm wrong but it's already in a T intersection like that where you where the road ends you have to yield to traffic. So even though the sign is not there, whether it's a stop sign or a yield sign, you are required by California law and the Motor uh, Department of Motor Vehicles code to yield traffic. Now, having been there 35 years or since the um, homes have been built, that's the first accident I have ever heard of or seen. Uh, and all the time we've lived there, we've never had a problem. And because it's already illegal not to yield, we see absolutely no reason to install any of these signs. Anyone who would ignore their yield at these streets anyway is not going to pay any attention to a stop sign. And I think I know exactly where this accident took place. It was a person coming out of a dead-end street. Again, a T-intersection. It's so obvious that you're going to pause there, you're going to look. I use that intersection at Aaron Lee and Golden Crest almost daily, and I have never had a visibility problem, and I have never had seen anyone else having a problem with that either. So we're opposed. It's uh, neighbors I've talked to, it's unnecessary, and it's unwanted. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our second speaker, uh, Daryl Jones, please. Mr. Jones, good evening. You have uh, three minutes. Okie dokie. Um, I've been in Deer Ridge since 91, so I've been there 32 years. Um, I was in and out of that place because I worked at Rocketdyne for 34, and the only accident I ever heard of was the one that this lovely lady brought up. We've never had a problem with any of the streets at all. Everybody goes down Antelope. I live way at the top of Antelope. It's a dead end. You come down Antelope to Golden Crest. You have the ability to rock left, right, and then left again. You go down Aaron Leah all the way to Windy. You look left, right, left. There's really no reason to have these stop signs at all. I just can't figure it out. And if you really notice it, people don't really abide by the stop signs because I hate to tell you, there's not a lot of police out there watching it. So they go right through. 
they'll, they, they don't even stop anymore. And uh, I have people that go down windy and they take over the se- second, uh, right in the center of the road because somebody's going too slow. But as far as I'm concerned, this, I oppose it. This is wrong. I mean, you're putting all this kind of stop signs up and then everybody, you're going to have, you can't park within a certain distance from the stop sign. So if you've got cul-de-sacs, where are the people going to park? Seriously. So I oppose it. Believe me, it's, it's all wrong. My wife sent in a letter, so I don't know whether you're going to read any of the uh, emails that came in, but I think you should because there's a lot of people that oppose it. And the only one I hear is the one that's off of Jantz and uh, whatever, but I oppose it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, speaker number three is uh, Sharon McMahon. Hello, um, I live in Deer Ridge also. I'm here to speak as a resident of Deer Ridge. It's a small neighborhood. You saw, heard like what, 130 houses. Most streets are cul-de-sacs. 11 stop signs are too much. I hope you all drove through my neighborhood and did your due diligence and saw how small it is and quiet. I believe there was a complaint and we just heard uh, about Golden Crest where Golden Crest meets with Aaron Lee Aaron Lee is a long street. It's got a steep downhill, and the section of Golden Crest is one of the few streets that goes through. It's not a cul-de-sac in that area, and it also gets traffic fed from a couple different streets into Golden Crest. So uh, I agree with the city that we do need a stop sign there. Um, But our city staff is thorough. They always want to do the right thing. I know this because I've worked for them. I was there where you're sitting for 20 years as a traffic commissioner. Uh, One stop sign for this one intersection is the right thing to do. More is not better in this situation. When, as as a previous uh, person said, when a cul-de-sac meets in a T with a through street, it is already in the vehicle code that drivers must yield to the larger street. There is no way that the police have the resources to sit and monitor these 11 intersections. Everyone who drives here will know that and disregard the stop signs. And because there are so many, they will disregard the one stop sign that we do need. The one, and isn't it interesting that the only one that I think who lives there and is there every day that I think is needed is the only one that they gave you the example of None of the others um, were, there, were an example of bad behavior. Um, I believe that 11 stop signs that will be disregarded and are unnecessary in this small neighborhood are also visual pollution. I also think that the cost to taxpayers for the installation and maintenance of these unwanted- You have one minute remaining. Okay, one uh, is unwarranted and unwanted expense. I think Mr. Mashiko and some of the other staff remembers the Pepper Tree Park parking situation. Again, staff tried to do the right thing for residents. It is a park with a lot of activity, a lot of sports, and parking is tough there. We had a hearing for angled parking. We could add additional parking if we angled it along Reno Road. It was a Wednesday night, just like tonight. A lot of people who work and who have kids didn't show up to tell us how they felt. We approved it, thinking we were doing, uh, doing the residents a favor. The result was a disaster. That neighborhood did not want it, and the city ended up taking it back to the way it was. So please only do what is appropriate and no more. One stop sign at the corner of Aaron Lee and Golden Trust is all we need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Our next speaker is uh, Elizabeth Pierce. Good evening. Uh, You have three minutes. Good evening. Nice to see everyone. Um, My husband, Jeff, and I are um, also residents of Deer Ridge. We live at 3356 Mountain Trail Avenue. We've been there for five years, and we love the neighborhood. Uh, We are also against the stop signs. And the reasons are um, they're expensive to add. We don't need that additional expense, um, especially these days. Um, there have been no accidents except, like you were saying, I didn't know about that one, but I have never seen one in the five years we've been there. 
uh, it would need policing, which um, is an extra cost and takes place from other things that are more important. It's an eyesore. We don't need more stop signs. Um, it would take us more time to get everywhere, and if we're safe and responsible, we don't need that, uh, which leads me to my last one, which is a, an example of over-regulation, which we feel um, it would be. So um, we, again, my husband and I are uh, against the uh, um, stop signs, and we live at 3356 Mountain Trail. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I believe we have somebody on Zoom, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we do have one online registrant, um, Rick Vitell. Rick, please click unmute and state your name and city of residence for the record. You'll be reminded when you have one minute remaining and again when your time to speak is up. Rick, are you there? Okay, there we go. Uh, the, the, the mute button just uh, appeared. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Yes. Hi, my name is Rick Vitell. Uh, I live at uh, 3154 Deer Valley Avenue. Uh, that's the house that is opposite the Remington Place cul-de-sac, uh, item 10 on this list of 11. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree with the previous uh, uh, three uh, uh, commentators. Um, yeah, I, my wife and I have lived uh, at 3154 Deer Valley Avenue for 25 years now. And from several rooms of our house, including the living room, kitchen, dining room, uh, den, we have a very clear uh, uh, visibility uh, line of sight to that T intersection where Remington dead ends at Deer Valley. Uh, I have never in 25 years seen anybody coming out of the Remington cul-de-sac uh, and just, just uh, it driving uh advancing directly onto deer valley without a prudent safe stop because uh it would be it would be foolhardy for them to do that uh because of the bend in in uh, uh deer valley avenue they have to come to a full stop they they can't even roll through there safely without coming to a full stop so a stop sign at that particular intersection just seems totally unwarranted. And uh, I, I, I believe, although I don't have direct visibility of the other you intersection. one minute remaining. I've, I've driven through the intersect, the development for 25 years. And uh, it, this just seems uh, excessive. I can understand uh, that where Golden Crest uh, 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 ends at Aaron Leah, uh, why that might warrant a stop sign, but I just don't think any of these other ones do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, just to confirm, do we have any other speakers on this item? No other speakers, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any staff response to uh, our public speakers this evening. Uh, yes, yes, I have some comments. Uh, I was taking some notes based on what was uh, uh, mentioned by the uh, speakers. Uh, someone mentioned about the vehicle code requirement that um, you, as a vehicle approaching on the terminating leg, you do have to yield the right of way, um, whether it's posted or not, that is correct. Um, however, uh, the, the issue that we're, we're looking at is the behavior is that, okay, our, although it's not posted, uh, stop signs would serve as that daily visual reminder to drivers that, um, you know, if they're rolling through, they're, they're, they're not stopping at all, uh, that what the vehicle code uh, regulation is that you do have to yield the right of way 
uh, versus if it's not posted, they don't get that daily reminder. And it, this is going to benefit uh, the um, uh, bicyclists as well as pedestrians who are approaching at that intersection. Uh, the issue that we look at from an engineering perspective is the line of sight. Uh, our engineering standard that we're looking at is to be able to see about 275 feet based on the 25 mile per hour speed limit of these residential streets. Um, and if you look at page three of the staff report, we list every intersection that we're, we're considering tonight. And it lists um, on the second column the cause of visual impairment whether it be landscaping, park vehicles, uh, road curvature, um, and then we identify on which corner of that intersection that Im impairment is located. So we do drove out to each of these locations to see do we have that 275 feet of un, um, you know, clear line of sight. And in each of these cases, we found that we did not have that 275 feet that we're looking for. Um, someone mentioned that these stop signs, once, you know, if they were to go in, parking would be eliminated. Uh, that is not the case. The stop signs would be placed um, on the corners where most of these locations already have a street name sign. So what we would do is um, elevate the height of the street name sign, post the uh, stop sign right below it. We would then add a limit line and then a stop uh, pavement marking to, to that terminating leg. And so I think that concludes the comments. Thank you. Just to confirm, any, any other staff members? No. Okay. Uh, I'll turn back to my fellow commissioners after, of course, thanking um, everyone who came out tonight, both online and uh, in person. Um, any, any public comment and feedback, that's why we're here. And... Um, that's why we're going to turn back to the commissioners and have a good conversation here. So any further questions uh, for staff on this item? Commissioner Callahan. Thank you. Uh, do we do we know what the cause of the collision was that occurred on, if I have it right, Holmes, Homestake and uh, Aaron Leia? The primary collision factor was a right-of-way violation. Yeah, which is driver failing to yield. Okay, but w w was there any additional context to that, such as distraction from a device or any other information that was provided in the the report? Not that I can remember, no. Okay. Um, is it safe to assume that there's a concern, you know, especially where this neighborhood is? You know, we all know Wendy and Lynn are, you know, higher speed main roads it is the primary concern from staff that as you're exiting uh you know those roads you're going at a higher velocity and then all of a sudden you're entering a neighborhood where children are and um it, you know there, there's a tendency maybe to be going through the neighborhood at a higher clip is is that is that what's prompting uh you know this discussion uh, no, b basically, I, I uh, may have mentioned it earlier uh, that you know we're just looking at engineering factors uh, at this lo these locations, and we're looking at that visibility. So if you're approaching f from the terminating leg, you know, do you have a clear line of sight? Um, and as if you were not going to stop, of um, you know, traffic on the 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 through street or the what's considered the major street, um, and in each of these locations, we did not find that. Uh, line of sight that we're looking for. Is it safe to assume behavior though? You typically see cars entering a neighborhood at a higher speed coming off of roads such as these? Um, yeah, I think it, it varies depending on location and, and you know where they're going to in the neighborhood. Uh, but usually there's always a report that a vehicle as they enter from the major street and into the residential street, there's always that concern that you know they're, they're still in the, in the mode of driving at a higher rate of speed. Yeah, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to, to balance, my final thought, is what I'm trying to balance is, you know, what, what we're hearing from the speakers and then, um, you know, what, what the engineering report and, and guidelines are saying. And, you know, if, to me, if, if, if there is some middle ground where a stop sign is put at the immediate 
you know, uh, spots there that have been discussed. Um, you know, that, that first installment coming off of Wendy and coming off of Lynn um, is enough to slow a car down and have someone have the awareness that they're entering, entering a neighborhood. Um, it's not really a question, it's a comment, so I'll conclude. Thank you, Commissioner. Other Commissioner comments, questions? Um, as a general question, I know we mentioned stop signs are not a speed control device. Uh, can we just get a general consensus as to why, why stop signs? You know, why would you choose to put a stop sign, not even in this particular instance, but what do we use stop signs for? I guess, broad question. Yeah, according to our, you know, engineering manual, the California um, Uniform Manual of uh, Traffic Control Devices, uh, basically stop signs are used to regulate right away at intersections. So that's exactly what they would be doing in, in these, um, at these locations. Okay. Um, what... I guess, did staff consider, um, because we, for, you know, some of our public comment people have attested to, uh, because for many, many years these folks have been living in these neighborhoods and driving these streets and having uncontrolled, essentially uncontrolled intersections, was there any other consideration or any other alternatives per given or thought of by staff before moving to something like a stop sign? And I'm just throwing it out there again. I'm not an engineer, but coming back to the vehicle code, uh, if we're looking for a daily reminder to yield versus a stop sign, would a yield sign be more appropriate? Because you can essentially put a stop sign there. It doesn't, it obviously changes the nature of that intersection and removes that vehicle code from really being there. But if we're looking for a visual reminder, would a yield sign be more appropriate versus a stop sign? Uh, yeah, yield sign could could be used. Um, however, um, that's where it's, uh, sometimes the yield definition might be a little bit ambiguous to to drivers, um, especially with the, the at, at the corners that we identified in the staff report. You know, there's there's the vegetation. There's could be parked cars. There's uh, road curvature, things like that. But uh, with a stop sign, it's 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 clear that you know uh, to avoid any conflict. We, we prefer vehicles do stop before they do enter the intersection so they avoid um, you know the conflict because they may not see uh, a vehicle that's coming you know down the street because they they couldn't see it because of the tree there or there's some shrubbery or thing, things uh, to that effect okay mm -hmm. um, and I guess maybe I'll go to the sergeant for the question but w what is a driver supposed to do in a yield situation Give it to me. Give it to me like you pulled you pulled me over, and want to explain it to me. Uh, what what am I supposed to do in these situations? So you, when it comes to yielding, the main thoroughfare, the main road has the right of way. The terminus road has to yield to it. So it would be depending on the size of the road, but these are basically cul-de-sacs that come down there. So it would be yielding to the vehicles in motion on the larger thoroughfare first. So I should be coming to the particular intersection, slowing if not coming to a complete stop while I gauge uh, I gauge the main thoroughfare and then based on that choosing to you know proceed proceed yes. correct okay thank you um, and I guess I just want to point out for also my fellow commissioners we also have Campbell Avenue at Fordham, which is not part of this neighborhood um i mean a different different portion of it but uh we do have that other issue which is actually a four-way stop correct and i guess i coming back to looking through this that was my initial question i was concerned about campbell and fordham being so close to lynn was there going to be any was there going to be any traffic that pushed pushed out to lynn or any concerns with the amount of traffic coming off of lynn um where that stop sign would be an issue 
Um, at that, that particular uh, location, I believe it, it would be uh, proposing it to be placed on Fordham Avenue. And on that Fordham leg, that's by Lynn, that, that um, street is closed off. There is a, there's a block wall there. Oh, you, that's right. You can't access uh, Lynn Road. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, but with, yeah, four legs, all four legs, there's no sign, no indication who should be yielding to the other person. Um, yeah, there's, there's been, there could be, you know, more frequency of issues of confusion as to who should be yielding. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one final stop for any additional questions before I close the public hearing. Okay. Uh, at this point, I'll go ahead and close this item to public comments, uh, open it up to uh, discussion or a motion this evening. Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. If, um, <clears throat> if I could just go ahead and maybe kick off my, my thoughts about uh, really the Deer Ridge uh, community in terms of the 11 stop signs. So I'm just trying to be a pragmatist here. Um, this community doesn't really seem to me to be like a pass-through community where people are shortcutting through it to avoid uh, larger roadways like Lynn and Wendy. It seems to me that this community is pretty isolated. Um, most of the people who are going to be coming into and going out of this community live there. Um, they know their way around the neighborhood. They know when they're supposed to yield. Um, given that and the dearth of collisions in the community, um, I'm kind of sympathetic to some of the uh, opposition to installing you know, 11 stop signs in a, in a neighborhood which has never had them before. Um, you know, also considering that 130 notices went out uh, regarding this, uh, this particular item and nobody has appeared to strongly support it, more stop signs, but you do have several people showing up to say, we don't really need it. And I'm kind of inclined to trust their judgment on that because they're the residents in the community. So those are my preliminary thoughts, but I'd like to hear what everybody else has to say. Thank you, and other commissioners' comments, thoughts? Um, on that note, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll just jump in. We do have one positive written comment, but it's for the Campbell Avenue at Fordham. Um, but I, I, I have a tendency to agree, and you know, I'm, I'm reminded of my time not only on this commission, but seeing other commissions do their work and knowing the history of our city, uh, we tend to do things a little slower than everybody else in terms of gradual change. Um, we did have one positive comment uh, on Golden Crest at Aaron Lea. I believe that was, yes, Golden Crest at Aaron Lea, um, which I have a tendency because of the nature of that particular T intersection, um, thinking about supporting. Um, but certainly, the rest of these this is a this is a large change for a single neighborhood and i i can understand and and certainly uh sympathize with the process that staff went through in in looking at this this is a older neighborhood this is a neighborhood that uh has had the ability to yield for many many years uh and we've heard from the residents in that regard um so kind of building off your comments. Um, the only one out of that 11 is that, that first one for me, that Golden Crest at Aaron Leia, that I'm, I have a tendency to support. Um, the rest of them, I, I think it's, I'm, I'm leaning towards it's too much too soon uh, without further study and, and feedback and, and getting a better understanding of what the neighborhood wants, although I think we have a, a, a very good understanding here tonight. Um, 
So I guess splitting it up into numbers just for sake of conversation, one and 12 on the recommendation to make it easy uh, to follow where I'm at. But again, I'm, I'm passing it around and seeing what other folks have to say. Yes. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I actually live in Newbury Park, and so I reside very close to the neighborhood that's up for discussion uh, and can attest to its quiet and peaceful nature uh, and can understand how 11 stop signs in a compact neighborhood might be a lot. Likewise with my, my uh, fellow commissioners, uh, I think I'd be open to the discussion of, of 1 in 12 as well uh, in support of and um, sort of taking it from there and, and seeing how the community responds to those stop signs and then possibly revisiting in the future if need be. Commissioner Hike. I just I want to go back to something you said if we built this neighborhood today each of those each of these locations would have a stop sign correct yes that is correct that's our current practice and somebody had mentioned something about cost not that cost is a strong factor but I'm just curious what is it cost to put in a stop sign uh, well the sign alone is probably uh, maybe material wise uh, 50 to 60 dollars and then there's the paint uh, for the limit line and the stop legend so maybe each location roughly uh, cost of five hundred dollars per location so then related to this if you put a stop sign and I don't I don't know and my apologies but what would be criteria for just to paint a crosswalk do do is there a lot of walkers and people crossing in the street yeah we have a, um, uh, a set of guidelines for marking a uh, crosswalk it is usually based on the amount of walkers the uh, line of sight issue, visibility, speed of traffic, and the, uh, the volume of traffic that's also on that roadway. So would these just be signs or would we letter and letter the street would stop with the line through it? Okay, this is at a, for a, a mark crosswalk or? No, no, for, if we're putting, we're putting stop signs, right? So do we also paint the street where the stop sign yes, is? Yes, it would have. For a, each of the locations? Stop, stop pavement legend as well as a limit line. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Callahan? I think I, I let my thoughts be known in the discussion a little bit with, with my comment, but um, I, I think the staff, uh, I think you guys are coming from a good place on this, right? I think you're coming from safety, um, and I, I appreciate the residents coming out and speaking. You, it, it, It's noteworthy if, if you've been in the uh, neighborhood for 35, 32 years, as some of you mentioned you know uh, what's going on um, on those roads. I just wanted to clarify uh, the commissioner comments um, about one and 12, 12 being the other neighborhood, I'm assuming, and then one uh, here, Golden Crescent, Aaron, Aaron Leah. Did I, I have it right though that the, um, the collision took place at number two. Okay, Are, did, did we, I heard one and 12, but did we, was that purposeful or do we do we want to look at two as well? I, I am also with you in kind of leaning towards this slower approach and um, you know, we are reacting to this collision that took place, but I do feel like based on everything we've heard tonight, it may be a step too far to go full bore with this, but I just wanted to get clarification from uh, commissioners. Yes, commissioner. Um, just to follow up on uh, Commissioner Callahan's comments, I, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that the city staff is motivated by public safety, as should we, um, and and that's to be appreciated. Um, I, as I, kind of, I hope I made clear in my previous comments, I just don't see a big public safety issue in this community, um, but certainly with respect to. Uh, locations 1 and 12 um, I don't think I really have an objection to that as far as location number two where the collision occurred um, I mean my thoughts on that whether right or wrong is that that was kind of an anomaly um, and that that collision could have happened at any one of these intersections and it just um, unfortunate but certainly by no means is it um, a likelihood to to happen again but I do agree with 
location one with the proximity to Wendy that um, maybe some some more care should be afforded at that particular intersection just because of the location yeah okay other commissioners uh, yeah in, in, in response I mean I can understand uh, number two um, and if it seemed to be if it was a different intersection maybe that you was coming really close to Golden Crest or one of the major entry points off of Lynn or Wendy um, where there's maybe higher traffic counts that have a tendency to add to but I really think that that intersection and that that incident was a was an anomaly um, I I have a tendency to agree on that um, you know and my my thought is that if we take this more measured approach this is not the end of the road in terms of possibilities for the particular neighborhood uh, I think it, we heard at the beginning of the presentation that uh, this is a yearly kind of stop sign installation action item. This is something that for my fellow commissioners new on the commission, you'll hear uh, a few times over the course of your term. And considering the nature of the cost involved, you know, this isn't something that is going to be a, uh, you know, this is a minuscule budget item in a large scale public works budgetary process. This isn't a traffic light that costs thousands of dollars. This is a $500 uh, uh, intersection. So this is something that I think we can explore down the line if there is uh, study and traffic counts and neighborhood feedback to revisit. Um, so I, I'll actually go ahead and um, make the uh, the motion um, and then we can we can take it piecemeal from there if we need to um, but my motion will be to consider the staff report receive public input and recommend to City Council adopt a resolution designating uh, numbers 1 and number 12 so two locations as intersections controlled by stop signs and directing staff to install stop signs at those two locations one being Golden Crest Avenue at Aaron Lea Avenue T intersection Golden Crest Avenue facing southbound traffic and number 12 Campbell Avenue at Fordham Avenue four-way intersection Fordham Avenue facing eastbound and westbound traffic I can open it up to other comments or we can just uh, we can jump in if there's no further discussion on a vote Commissioner Chair, I, I would support that motion. Okay. Hearing no other comments, uh, I'll go ahead and ask uh, Mrs. Vasquez, please call the vote. Commissioner Amell? Yes. Commissioner Callahan? Yes. Commissioner Orozco? Yes. Vice Chair Hayek? Yes. And Chair Pletcher? Yes. Okay, motion carries five to zero. The Traffic Commission makes recommendations to the City Council and interested parties may attend the City Council meeting and speak either for or against the recommendation of the Traffic Commission. Any person wishing to appeal a decision of the Traffic Commission shall file a written appeal and pay an appeal fee with the city clerk department within 14 calendar days of this decision. The matter will be referred to the city council at the earliest reasonable and available date. The appeal fee will be refunded only if the city council overturns the traffic commission's decision. An appeal form is available from the recording secretary. Thank you, Mrs. Vasquez, and I wanna thank, uh, again, everyone that came out tonight the public speakers um, you know as mrs. Vasquez just mentioned this will go to City Council for final approval so uh, I will say the road is not over here tonight look for it at City Council and please um, continue to voice voice your uh, opinions so thank you um, 
Moving on next, we have a second engineer's report that's uh, information item um, to be presented on item 6B, Rancho Canal Biotech Area Sidewalk Project. Um, engineering Associate Razavi, did I get it right? Yes. Second time. The floor is yours, <laughs> sir. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Chair Pletcher and members of the commission for the opportunity to provide you with this update on Rancho Conejo Biotech Area Sidewalk Project. My name is Masood Razavi, and I'm an engineering associate for the Public Works Department's Capital Projects Division. As you see in the presentation, the main project objective is to make the area more pedestrian friendly. The city has an ongoing program to construct sidewalks throughout the community to improve pedestrian mobility and Public Works Department maintains a planning document that prioritizes incomplete sidewalk locations throughout the city, which is based on several factors, including pedestrian traffic volumes, proximity to schools, and road classifications. These, these project locations rank among the top locations identified in the need, in the need for pedestrian enhancements. The project is located in the Rancho Canelo Biotech area of the city, which is generally north of 101 Freeway and west of Rancho Canelo Boulevard. As part of this project, we'll be installing incomplete sidewalk segments within the project limits, retrofitting existing curb ramps to meet ADA requirements, and providing enhanced crosswalks. Lack of sidewalk in the proposed locations causes pedestrians to walk in the street through dirt or landscape area. The incomplete sidewalk sec sections are located on Teller Road, Lawrence Drive, Hillcrest Drive, and Corporate Center Drive. We'll take a closer look at each segment and show you a comparison between the existing conditions and the project's proposed enhancements. The first segment shown here is Teller Road from Lawrence Drive <coughs> to Marion Street which is approximately 1,000 feet. Proposed sidewalks will be on the north side of the street, shown in red. Here, we'll add a new eight-foot wide sidewalk and reconstruct the two curb ADA curb ramps. The bottom pictures show the existing segments, which have no sidewalks. Moving to segment two, we have Lawrence Drive between Hillcrest Drive and Teller Road. Here, will extend the existing sidewalk on the west side of the street to Hillcrest Drive, will add a mid-block crosswalk, and add a new street light at the, at the crosswalk. Segment three is Hillcrest Drive from Mitchell Drive to about 1,000 feet west of Lawrence Drive. The aerial map highlights the proposed improvements, and the photos show the existing condition. Here, we'll construct six-foot-wide sidewalks and a bioswale on the west side of the in intersection, as well as installing marked crosswalks at the intersection of Hillcrest Drive and Lawrence Drive, and adding new street lights at three locations. Here's a closer view of the Hillcrest Drive at Lawrence Drive that shows the proposed sidewalks, marked crosswalks, and the street lighting. And finally, we have segment four, which is the improvements on uh, Corporate Center Drive. At this location, we'll extend the sidewalk on both sides of the street to access Rancho Canelo Boulevard and install an enhanced pedestrian crosswalk at the intersection, which features rapid flashing beacons, the RRFBs, mounted atop a signal mast arm and warning beacons in advance of the intersection on Rancho Canelo Boulevard. Here's a closer view of this segment showing sidewalks, pedestrian crosswalks, and rapid flashing beacons on the north leg of the intersection. The photos on the right show the existing conditions, which illustrate the need for intersection enhancements in order to safely cross Rancho Cornell Boulevard. This picture shows the existing flashing beacons mounted atop mast arms at intersection of Herbs Road at Hauser Circle. This helps to illustrate the visual effectiveness of having elevated warning signs and beacons to alert drivers of pedestrian activity when the warning system is activated. 
at this, loca this location doesn't feature rapid flashing beacons since it was constructed prior to the development of, the, of this uh, system. However, we make it the practice to incorporate the most current technologies at newly constructed enhanced crosswalks by featuring rapid flashing beacons at the crosswalk, advanced warning beacons ahead of crosswalk, yield pavement markings, the shark teeth, and fluorescent warning yellow lights, yellow signs. Uh, this is an example of an advanced warning beacon set several hundred feet before the enhanced crosswalk. These warning beacons can be equipped with a single LED light shown on the left or a double LED shown on the right, which blinks alternatively to get the driver's attention. For this project, we're looking to use the double LED option due to the width of the street as well as the speed of traffic. And this photo shows the type of yield pavement markings and yield to pedestrian signs to be used at the crosswalk on Rancho Canelo Boulevard. The project includes funding, um, the project funding includes $1.6 million from federal funding uh, from COVID Relief and Recovery Supplemental Appropriation Act, CRESA. Uh, this is the first time we're receiving this type of grant and $1.6 million from general funds. The project is currently in the design phase. We anticipate completing the design by summer of this year and submitting the project for Caltrans approval and fund obligation in spring of 2024 with construction targeted to start by fall of 2024. Our community outreach will focus on the businesses adjacent to the project through the methods listed as well as door-to-door -door outreach after 90% design completion. Recommendations are listed in the staff report to receive project information, receive public input, and provide feedback. This concludes our presentation for Rancho Canelo Biotech Area Sidewalk, and we'll be glad to answer any project-related questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do the commissioners have any questions for staff? Commissioner Hayek. Some of the photos had trees pretty close to the street lines. What, happened to, what happens to the trees that are in the way of where the sidewalks would go? Um, we have a, our consultant is providing us with a tree report. Um, we, I believe we are, um, we would be eliminating two trees. Um, but in the bioswale that I mentioned on Hillcrest Drive, we'll be planting trees in the, in the bioswale as well. Um, and on Teller Road, we'll be using um, uh, tree planters in the sidewalk, three by three planters on the sidewalk. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Callahan. Just to piggyback on that question, is, it, is my assumption right if essentially you're, you're narrowing the road to create the sidewalk rather than, it seemed like there were more than two trees um, in, in one of the photos. It looked like there were five at least that would need to be removed. Um, is it, is it, the, the road does look pretty wide. Is, is that what's happening? You're just putting the sidewalk further in we are not moving the roadway we're not getting into the roadway okay we're going to stay within the city's right away behind the curb so we are we will be repairing the curbs at the sections that need to be repaired but we're trying to um, keep the cost down and keep everything behind um, yeah the pictures are to an extent deceiving um, i've been out there with tape measures and they are outside um, we've had our city um, landscape division out there and we've looked at it and we're, we're going to be paying very close attention especially in on um, Rancho Canelo um, on um, Corpus Center Drive some of those trees are kind of too close for my comfort but uh, um, our consultant will give us all of that information thank you thank you other questions I'll just say thank you for the presentation and um, you know I just want to compliment city staff on getting that extra federal that VCTC federal funding um, staff always works so so incredibly hard at getting that extra pieces of funding so I want to thank you it's a lot of work um, certainly noted and uh, appreciated um, just a 
drill down on a, a couple points just because I looking at details on the Hillcrest section. Um, can you tell me just what is a, a bioswell? Kind of a newer term. I apologize. I don't have a picture of it here, um, a slide for you. Um, a bioswell is, uh, in this case, it's going to be 12 foot wide um, section that's going to be dug in. So if, if you were to look at a, um, if you look at a, look at it, it's just simply, it's a ditch that is covered with um, plant material that will survive. And it's, and it actually uses, we use that to be able to treat uh, the runoff, the stormwater runoff. Um, on Hill, the reason we're using it on Hillcrest is because the, um, especially on the west side of Lawrence is because all of that water from the runoff from the parking lot just simply goes into our storm drains and it doesn't do anything. It comes into the street and into the storm drains. This way we can treat that water before we, um, we try to get some infiltration in there. I think that's an absolutely fabulous, uh, you know, design addition and concept. I've actually, now that you've kind of defined it for me, I've seen it in some planning magazines and, and seen it used before. I think it's a great, great addition. Um, uh, if I can just add a little bit to that, uh, Nader Hidari. Yeah, we're trying to incorporate that in all of our new projects as a best practice, best management practice to incorporate stormwater pollution uh, control, stormwater treatment and uh, retention where we can. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, an infiltration where possible, which isn't always possible in town, but at least as the water passes through the bioswale, the biological contact with the plant material helps eliminate some pollutants. And also you get some settlement of any debris or you know, paper cups or something that may be in there that can be caught there before it goes into the waterways. So that's uh, something new we're, we're trying to incorporate on uh, every project we have, and right. which we did uh, recently on Willow Lane. Willow Lane has one uh, as you're driving that's about right. halfway down it. Uh, it's a smaller one, but it's a more of a linear one. And then we also have uh, also one on Lawrence Drive and Teller. So it's a newer element, and we're, we're keeping up with the times. So. Well, I think, again, I think it's... Uh a great addition. Um, you had mentioned you had the slide about the uh, the outreach. Is there a target? Perhaps I missed it, and I apologize if I did. Is there a target time in which the outreach will begin for the businesses? Um, we just got the public website up, the project website up. Um, we'll be starting right now because we're at 65%. We still have a lot of information that we need to um, go through. Once we get the 90%, that's when I mentioned at 90%, it's going to be a full-on public outreach, including going door to door, door to door. So I'll be out there with my yellow yellow jacket, going around and trying to feel as much uh, um, as I can. That's for the um, owners, um, for the for the properties. So not only the owners will know, but also the tenants will know what's going on. I think that's great. Um, are there any, um, just because it's, a, it's an area that hasn't been previously had these improvements made, are there any right-of-way acquisition issues, or are we 100% on that? We are working within our right-of-way, so we're not going to be um, asking for any right-of-way. We will be needing some permit to enter because some of the driveways need to be, once we put the sidewalk in, we definitely would have to um, fix their driveways which means we need to get into their driveways. But uh, that's, other than that, we're not, we're trying to stay away from it. That's, that's a bigger red tape with Caltrans than I wanted it to be. A hundred percent. I've, I've done a few of those on the legal end in the past and they're, they're nothing but a headache. So I, I'm glad you guys are working within your already established right away. Um, I had no further questions, but I'll turn it back one more time to commission before we move on. Yes. I'll move it. Um, well, I still have to go to, do we have any public speakers just to confirm with Mrs. Vasquez? Uh, zero individuals have requested to speak and no written statements have been submitted. Okay. I got to check boxes as a, as a, as a chair, everybody. Um, okay. Uh, last call on discussion. Okay. We'll move on. Thank you very much for the presentation.
Uh, we will move on to item six, uh, reflective traffic signal backplates at 32 intersections adjacent to the 101 and 23 freeways. Uh, report by Associate Engineer Robert Sweeting. Good evening, sir. There we go. Good evening. Um, I will be given the staff report regarding the reflective backplates on traffic signals. Um, my name is Robert Sweeting. I'm one of the engineers here at the City of Thousand Oaks in the Public Works Department. So the City Council adopted a local road safety plan back in August of 2021. That is part of the requirement that is uh, needed to get an HSIP grant, which is your Highway Safety Improvement Program. Um, and that is to help develop uh, areas uh, within the community uh, to improve commuter uh, bicycle, pedestrian safety um, data was collected. And one of those safety items that was identified was to put in yellow reflective back, to, excuse me, back plates on uh, 32 of our 136 traffic signals. So as part of that HSIP um, program, uh, it is uh, administered by Caltrans and it is to help local agency reduce their costs of doing some uh, significant reductions in traffic fatalities, uh, serious injuries on the public roadway. Um, and this project was approved uh, by Caltrans as a, an appropriate action to take. So what is the benefit of a re uh, reflective backplate? It is to enhance the visibility of traffic signals during inclement weather daytime, nighttime. It is also for uh, easier for older and colorblind drivers to identify the traffic signals. It does help reduce uh, collisions by 15 to 24 percent. Um, it is also easier to recognize a dark signal when there's no power due to traffic collisions, uh, traffic control that may be implemented, uh, other ro road work or Edison uh, public safety uh, power shutoff events that have occurred from time to time. So I do have a few slides to show you to kind of identify those back plates. So in this photo, you'll see in the center, uh, there is a traffic signal with no back plate. To your right and left, you'll see signals with a back plate. So what that does is it helps give a background effect uh, to, to help identify the signal indication kind of gives it some depth perception to it. So what the, the reflective back uh, plate is, is a yellow reflectorized two inch piece of basically border tape that goes around the outer edges of the back plate. Here's a local road out at uh, the 101 northbound uh, off ramp at Windy Drive. You can see in the background that there are some yellow where the red circles are, there's some uh, reflective back plates there. On the near ground or the near side at Granda Vista, there is not any yellow uh, tape. And so it's easy to kind of see how it stands out. Um, and this is at a new signal. That's kind of why you see the uh, flags there is to help identify that there was a signal there. In this case, it's only about 100 feet between intersections and people weren't uh, always adhering to the signal heads. So we had had some uh, compliance issues out there. We had tried multiple other things to install and then we added uh, the reflectorized tape as you see here. So if you go back, here's the before again, here's the after, you can see how the yellow uh, tape helps bring to your attention and our compliance rate went down significantly at that particular location. Here's one at night. 
you can see the two signal heads on the left have the yellow tape. The one on the right does not. So you can see how it helps illuminate and identify a, a traffic signal. Here's one actually about a week ago out at Olson and the 23 uh, southbound ramps that even during the daytime, uh, the power was off at this location. And you can see how it still frames the signals where you can see um, that at a, you know, at a signal when there's no power, no um, indications that it becomes a multi-way stop. There are 32 of our 136 uh, traffic signals that we're looking to do here. This is the location map. The majority of them are at or near um, the 101 and the 23 freeway. Also, a couple of our major corridors, as Thousand Oaks Boulevard and Moore Park Road. Um, and this is also where our higher volumes are and some of our higher collision rates. That's what we kind of use to determine these locations. And the tentative schedule is to, uh, for the installation, is to advertise, uh, to get bids for those here in the coming months in the summer. Uh, go to uh, City Council for approval of the contract uh, and then start the installation process in the fall of 23, hoping to be completed by um, the spring of 24. There are approximately 562 signal heads at those 32 locations that would have to be uh, done. So staff is uh, recommending uh, that we receive public input and commissioner input and proceed uh, to city council for authorization to go out for bid. And with that, I will take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, commission have any questions for staff? Commissioner Immel. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the report. Um, on the surface, this looks like like kind of like a no-brainer like why would you not do it if if you had the money to do it and it was available why would you not um on the on the traffic signals that already have a, a back plate is it simply a, a function of like putting reflective tape around the edge of that black tape or, or that uh, that that uh back plate or do do you have to just completely take down what's currently there and put up a, a brand new piece of equipment you actually have the option of both so when you get a new one so our brand new intersection at Lawrence and Teller it came that way with the back plates in this case we would be just adding tape to the outer edges which is what we did at Grande Vista you buy a roll of tape and literally go up and and tape it around the outer edges of the back plate so that would be our installation process in this case uh, because in order to do it the opposite way, to buy it already on there, there are multiple um, types of signal heads, and we'd have to literally go out and do a survey of all signal heads and their brand and types in order to get that installed. So the easier, uh, cheaper way is to just simply get tape and add it to it. Okay. Um well, that sounds great. I, I was just looking at the, you know, the cost for um, for the project is one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars, and so I was going to volunteer my services and my ladder. If you'll sh stop traffic for me, I, I I will go up and put reflective tape around the back plates. Um, but uh, no, I, this looks good to me. Um, so, well done. Thank you. Other commissioners, Commissioner Rosco. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, and thank you so much, staff, for for the report. Uh, just a quick question as to how you got, how you came to select the intersections that you uh, are proposing today. Yeah, again, it's uh, near the 101, the 23, which has the most volume of traffic as people are coming off the roadway. Uh, also, uh, collision rates. So we looked at all of those. Um, as a factor and then determine we want to start with that so uh, that doesn't mean we won't do more later but that's we want to start with where we have higher rates and more volume great thank you other questions um what's the uh i guess what's the wear and tear then when you put up these reflective tapes like maintenance schedule um you we look at these every five years ten years how long does this tape last 
Well, theoretically, it should last 10 years. But we've got a lot of equipment that theoretically should last that long, and they're lasting 20, 30 years. But, oh, wow. Um, but like anything else, um, sun, uh, use, wind can have an effect, but they should last at least 10 years. Thank you. Um, I certainly see at the Grande Vista drive there all the time with Target and Lowe's and everything. I, without uh, my compliance factor at that particular intersection, you know, I've slammed on my brakes more times realizing that there's, because my, your, your, your whole field of vision is down the line. You, you, so I certainly see the benefits of uh, programs like this. Um, Here at Sergeant Travis. We can we can talk after, Sergeant. Um, do you have any speaker? Uh, any other questions before I move on? See if there's any public speakers this evening. Okay, hearing none. Do we uh, have any speakers, Mrs. Vasquez, for tonight or for this engineering report? Uh, zero individuals have requested to speak on this item, and no written statements have been submitted. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for staff? Okay, and we'll go ahead and close this item to public comments, open it up to discussion and a potential motion uh, from commissioners. Vice Chair Hayek. I'll make the motion to accept the staff's recommendation. Wonderful. Um, Mrs. Vasquez, please call the vote. Commissioner Amell? Yes. Commissioner Callahan? Yes. Commissioner Orozco? Yes. Vice Chair Hayek? Yes. And Chair Pletcher? Yes. Okay, motion carries five to zero. And thank you again for the presentation. Uh, moving on to item seven, uh, status reports of prior traffic commission recommendations. Uh, everyone sees, unless staff had anything, comments to add, I'll just point out. Uh, oh, Mr. Mashiko. No, no, no additional comments. Okay. Um, Traffic commission date obviously changed, 5-0 vote from the city council on March 14th. Uh, yes. I just wanna say thank you to the commission for agreeing to move the dates and the city council for approving. Um, I had put in that request um, because of our school board meetings conflicted with the traffic um, commission meetings, so I appreciate it, thank you. It's kind of a roundabout schedule, the school board moves because of this, nah, nah, never mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, moving on to item eight, commission referrals from February 15th, 2022. We have none. Um, item nine, work program and commission schedule. Um, looking at future agenda items, any questions for staff? Okay, hearing none. Uh, moving on to item 10, our traffic commission comments. Um, Open comments. Okay. Um, moving on, item 11, future meetings, uh, discussion and possible cancellation of the May 24th, 2023 meeting. Um, obviously, we have no hot button topics. Thinking of, okay. So do we need a motion for it or what do we need, Mr. Assistant City Attorney? I mean, if, <clears throat> excuse me, if the commission agrees with that, then you can just adjourn to, under number 12, adjourn to the June 28th meeting instead of the May 24th meeting. Perfect. I thought so, but I always like to check with the boss. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to item 12, adjournment. The uh, next meeting to be held at 6 p.m. on June 28th, 2023 in the boardroom of the Civic Arts Plaza on the third floor. Good night.